So let's do a problem. Find the limit as x goes to 2 of the square root of 5x squared plus 5 minus x minus 3 divided by x squared plus x minus 6. Now when we want to understand something, one of the first things you should always do is say, well, let's just try to plug in the number and see what happens. So what's happening? Well, downstairs you get 4 plus 2 minus 6. That's pretty simple. Upstairs, let's see, we're going to get uh, 5 times 4 is 20 plus 5, so you get the square root of 25 minus 2 minus 3. And if you simplify, square root of 25 is 5 minus 2 minus 3 uh, is 0. Downstairs, 4 plus 2 minus 6, also 0. And so right now, as in its current form, it's going to 0 over 0, which, of course, we know means that we need to do more work. Now, more work is secret code for cancel zeros. In other words, something's causing the zeros in the numerator and the denominator. And what we need to do is find a way to extract that and, and somehow get them to knock each other out. And then whatever's left, well, that should help explain what, it, what the behavior should be. Now, our big obstacle right here is our square root. We say, okay, well, how do you deal with square roots? And, and the answer is, when you see a square root, one of the best tools, and the one we use almost all the time, is the conjugate. And remember that that's based on a plus b times a minus b is a, a squared minus b squared. Okay. So if like a was a square root, then I get a squared, no more square root. But there's a good question here. And let's not trivialize it. Notice that really this, this involves like two terms. Here I have three terms. The square root, that minus x, and that minus 3. So we have to get down to 2. And how do we do it? Well, the, the answer is we definitely want to get rid of the square root. That should be a term in and of itself. So what we should really do is think of it in the following way. Square root. 5x squared plus 5 minus, and I'm going to put these together, x plus 3. Downstairs, x squared plus x minus 6. So, we're going to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. 5x squared plus 5 plus x plus 3 and square root 5x squared plus 5 plus x plus 3. Because remember, whatever you do to the top, you've got to do to the bottom. You've got to make sure it's the same expression. And by same, we mean up to equivalence, algebraic equivalence. So, whatever our original limit does, it's the same as this new limit. So what does this new limit become? Well, let's deal with the upstairs. You have your a minus b, your a plus b. So you get your a squared, which will become 5x squared plus 5, minus your b squared, x plus 3 squared. Now downstairs, you're like, oh, that's going to take us a long time. But here's the rule of thumb. Don't expand unless it's helpful to expand. And in general, there's a lot of times when it's not helpful. Because you, what happens is when you expand, you sort of lose information. So we're going to keep these two pieces, that x squared plus x minus 6, and that square root of 5x squared plus 5 plus x plus 3 separate. And in fact, we're going to do one other thing, which is we know that that term should factor. Not that we want it to factor. We know it has to factor. And the reason that we know that it has to factor is because when we plug in 2, we got 0, which means that there's a nice root. In fact, one of the terms has to be x minus 2, because that would make 2 a root, is x minus 2. So what's the other term? Well, if I want to get to negative 6, and I have a negative 2, I'll use plus 3. So the x minus 2 times x plus 3 is that first term, and everything else. All right. Good. There we go. Now let's work in the numerator. So, a little side work here. 
So if we have 5x squared plus 5 minus, I'm going to put a parenthesis here because that minus, you have to be careful, it has to go to everything. x squared plus 6x plus 9. See, a lot of people would say, oh yeah, the minus x squared, but they would forget. It's also got to go to the other terms. So that would be 5x squared plus 5 minus x squared minus 6x minus 9. Or 4x squared, because I can combine the x squareds, minus 6x, and plus 5 minus 9 is minus 4. All right, good. Well, can we simplify? Hmm. In fact, we know we can. We know we can do a couple of things. First off, we look at common terms. The, these all have even numbers, so we can factor out a 2. So this is 2. 2x squared minus 3x minus 2. And we say to ourselves, well, do we think this will factor? And in fact, we're very confident it will factor because we suspect. See, remember that x is going towards 2. Before we got a 0. If we plug in 0 now, what do we get? 2 times 4 is 8 minus 6 minus 2, which means we still get a 0, which means that 2 still is a root. So 2 is a root of this polynomial, therefore it has to factor with one term as x minus 2. Well, what would the other term have to be? Well, to get the minus 2, since I have a minus 2 there, I need a plus 1. To get the 2x squared, since that's x, I'll need a 2x. And now for sanity, we just check the middle term. So we're going to get 2x squared, x minus 4x, that's minus 3x minus 2. All right, so updating. So this is the limit as x goes to 2. Upstairs, 2 times x minus 2 times 2x plus 1. Downstairs, x minus 2, x plus 3. And square root of 5x squared plus 5 plus x plus 3. Good. All right. So we've taken some algebraic steps, factoring, expanding, conjugation, working it out, and we've rewritten it in this form. Now here's the key step, the key observation. Remember, we said up here, cancel zeros. Now before, it wasn't clear if anything could cancel, but now we say, oh, wait a second. Both terms have an x minus 2. And if you think about what do the x minus 2's do, well, when you plug in 2, they cause things to be 0. So in essence, these are now our zeros. We can cancel them out. And we can get away with it because, again, we only care what happens when x is not 2, so they're not 0. We can definitely cancel out. And now what are we left with? Limit as x goes to 2, upstairs 2 times 2x plus 1, downstairs, x plus 3, times square root of 5x squared plus 5, plus x plus 3. So, what happens when you plug in 2? Well, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1, 5, times another 2, gives us upstairs 10. Well, good, not 0, so whatever happens, has to happen. Downstairs. 2 plus 3, 5. All right, here we're going to get uh, 2 squared 4 times 5 is 20, plus 5, 25, squared 25 is 5. And then we're going to get plus 5 more. So that'll be 10. Ah, well, we have a 10 upstairs, we have a 10 downstairs, and therefore our final answer, 1 fifth. Great. All right, so we can do it. It's algebra. Being careful and following the rules. We like to follow the rules. The more you follow the rules, the more fun math is. Now, it's our one of our first few math therapy sessions, so one last piece of advice. And this is, how can you improve? So work on your communication skills. Communication is a really important tool because that's how we communicate to each other ideas. 
And the ability for you to communicate ideas helps you to reinforce what you know. So explaining things to other people is very important. It'll help identify what you don't understand, and it'll help to cement what you do understand. Now, one of the things that you have to think about is what do we actually grade on? So we cannot hook you up to a machine and say how good you are at math. There is nothing that we can do that measures how good you are at math. But here's what we can measure. How good are you at communicating your math? And that's what we, we really get, is when we see your exam and we see your answers, what we're seeing are your communications, your ideas on how to solve problems. And so you want to make sure that you really enforce and practice that good communication. Because the better you communicate, the, the better your score will be. I've often had students come to me after an exam and say, I know the math. Why do I keep getting low scores? And the problem is that they make small mistakes, they're very sloppy, they're inconsistent, and so they're missing key ideas. Whereas other people who may not feel very confident in their knowledge are much better at communicating what knowledge they have. So work on that. So how do you do it? Work in groups. Everyone takes turn explaining. Make sure you ask lots of questions, and uh, make sure you keep your answers organized and easy to follow. It's nice for your grader, but it's also nice for you, because at the end of an exam, you might want to go back and just double check your work. Well, if you can't follow your argument, odds are pretty good, neither will the grader. So, I guess uh, one last piece of advice, and uh, written down here, and uh, this should say, I hope. Kan ji shui jinan. It's a Chinese expression. And it says, when you see, it looks easy. But when you study, it's hard. This happens in, in any sort of skill that takes time to develop. So when you see people doing certain events, uh, certain uh, things, you might say, well, that's easy. I can do that. And then you try it and you find out, oh, it's actually not very easy. It takes a lot of work. That happens in math. You see the instructor up at the, the front of the room and they're doing a problem and it's so easy when you see them do it. It flows. There's not even a pause, a stutter. There's no question about what to do next. It's just so obvious. But then when you do it and you start to do problems, you discover it's hard. How, how do you get better? You practice. You practice. And the more you practice, the better you get. All right. So today, we're going to start with a really simple idea, which is called the, the squeeze theorem. It's also known as the sandwich theorem. Uh, you might call it like the squish theorem. But it's a really simple idea. And it helps us to understand certain limits. And the picture is very compelling. So let's talk about our picture to gain understanding. What's happening is we're going close to C. So X is approaching C. So, so our X values, these are the inputs, and we're approaching C from either direction. So what happens is that there's some function which we haven't graphed, but it's in between two functions which we have. So I have this bottom function, G of X, and this top function, h of x. And the moral is that my missing function is in between. So it's doing something, in, now it could be doing something very erratic, but it's in the middle. So even if it's going up and down a lot, it's, it's not going up and down very much because g of x and h of x are approaching the same value of l as x goes close to c. So what happens is whatever that f of x does, it's getting squeezed in between. It's forced to also approach L. And that's the, that's the whole idea. So if I have something above and something below which approaches the same value, anything in the middle also approaches the same value. Now, you'll notice that this word is italicized, near. That says, look, we don't care what happens far away. So for instance, it could be the case that far away the, what are G and H, they switch roles. So maybe H goes underneath G, but it doesn't matter 
because limits only care about what happens nearby. So anything far away, and far away can be, you know, a hundred, or it could be one one million, it doesn't matter. It just says, what happens in the near? Because limits are about what happens nearby. So, all right, well, why would we have such a result? Why do we need such a result? Well, so let's talk about an example where this can be very helpful. In particular, what happens is we may have something which is behaving very poorly. And uh, that's bad. But the other part may not behave poorly at all. And so we might be able to, to extract that. So here's the thing. Suppose I look at th this limit. x goes to 0 of x sine 1 over x. Now we talked about sine 1 over x before. Now sine 1 over x comes off from infinity, but then it starts to oscillate up and down. And it goes infinitely many oscillations. And of course it does the same thing on the other side until it starts to spread out again. All right. Well, the question is, okay, how do we handle this? Is there no limit? Well, notice we now have this extra term here. So what's happening is sine 1 over x, it might behave really poorly in terms of going up and down, but notice that as it goes up and down, it goes up and down in, a, in a, at least one way that's controlled, which is that this is always bounded. And in particular, it's bounded between negative 1 and positive one. So while it's going up and down, it's, con it's a controlled up and down. So that's going up and down, and the x is going towards zero. So how do we use this? Well, one way to use this is to sort of say, okay, so how can we bound it above and below? And the answer is we say that if I look at the size, so let's just look at the size, x sine one over x. Well, the sine 1 over x, because it's between negative 1 and positive 1, uh, we can think of this as absolute value of x times absolute value of sine 1 over x, this part is always at most 1. So this is less than or equal to absolute value of x. Now, what that tells us is it tells us that x sine 1 over x, if we drop the absolute value, is always less than or equal to absolute value of x, and always greater than or equal to negative absolute value of x. So if we now sketch that, so we have this curve called absolute value of x. Here we go, here's absolute value of x. And now we have another curve, which we call negative absolute value of x. And there's that curve. Then our last curve, our middle curve, is always in between these two. So our x sine 1 over x, whatever it's doing is going in between these two curves. So while it's oscillating up and down infinitely often as I come in towards zero, it's oscillating in a way that's getting closer and closer. Because the limit as x goes to zero of absolute value of x is zero, and the limit as x goes to zero of minus absolute value of x is zero, then I can conclude by the squeeze that the limit as x goes to 0 of x sine 1 over x is also 0. All right, so that's an example. So if you ever see something which has this sort of high-frequency repetition going on, a bounded thing by something going to 0, the 0 will, will help knock that out. That's usually one of the most common ways that we use the squeeze there, but it's not the only one. We'll, we'll see some more later on. Now, another thing we want to talk about are one-sided limits. Now, we talked about approaching C. And we want to be close to C, but there are really two ways to be approaching C. One is from above. In other words, you're a little bit larger than C. And the other is from below. You're a little bit less than C. And so we indicate these as of saying either from the positive direction or the negative direction. So positive and negative here are indicating orientations. So positive says you get a go up, negative says you go down. So limit as x approaches c negative, 
It doesn't mean that we're approaching negative C. It means we're approaching the value of C from the negative direction. Sometimes it's called from below, or we say from the left. C positive means we're approaching from above or from the right. All right, well, why do we care about one-sided limits? Well, there's two reasons, and we have one of them here. One is you may have a function which is only defined on one side. So let's talk about an example. The limit as x approaches 2 of the square root of 4 minus x squared. Well, what does that look like? If you graph the curve y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, it actually is a kind of a familiar curve. It's the top half of a circle of radius 2. So it looks like that. Negative 2 and positive 2. But the problem here is it's not defined if I'm larger than 2. Because I can't take a square root of a negative number. At least not in our class. If you want a class where you can take a square root of a negative number, well, I, we, can, we have suggestions. We have classes for that. Because it's not defined above 2, I can't ask what's happening around 2. Because the problem is, on the left, sure, I can talk about it. But on the right, it doesn't make any sense. So the limit as x approaches 2, square root of 4 minus x squared, it doesn't exist. Because I can't ask what's happening above 2. On the other hand, if I say, well, what happens as I approach 2 from below? See, now I don't care about what happens above 2. It could do whatever it wants. Now I'm only coming from this one side. And when I come from that one side, I say, aha, what's happening is I'm coming down towards 0. So the answer is 0. All right, well, that's one reason. Now, of course, if we put the number 1 down, there's probably going to be at least a number 2. And there is a second reason. It's not totally unrelated to what we just did. But we should still state it. And that's what we have, our work called piecewise. Now, what do we mean by piecewise? Well, piecewise is a way to say we have a function, but it's not defined for every value in the same way. So in other words, different values of x have different behaviors. And so what we want to do is say, look, let's separate the function into its different pieces and understand each piece separately. So let's look at the following. Uh, let's look at something involving absolute value of x. So we want to look at what happens to the limit as x approaches 0 of absolute value of x over x. And we looked at 0 in three different cases. As we go from above, as we go from below, or as we just go arbitrarily. Now absolute value of x is a good example because absolute value of x is, is an example of a piecewise function. As an example, absolute value of x is oftentimes written as x if x is greater than 0 and minus x if x is less than 0. Now we can say less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. There we go. So let's think about what happens. So suppose I want to know what happens as x approaches 0 from above. So that says x is a positive value because I'm above 0. x is a positive value. So in that case, what we see is that because we're in the piece where x is positive, this is the same as x approaches 0 from above of x over x. Now I can use the fact that I know what my piece looks like. And x over x, well, that's the same as 1 because I can cancel them. And I can say, well, I know what 1 does. 1 goes towards 1. Now, what about this? x goes to 0 from below. Absolute value of x over x. Well, I say I know what that function does. It's piecewise. So because I'm below 0, that's what that negative indicates. I'm below 0. And that's the same as limit as x goes to 0 from below of negative x. Because below 0, I flip the sign. And again, I can cancel the x's. So that's the limit as x goes to 0 from below of negative 1. Well, that's negative 1. Now, how do we answer this third question? Well, let's think about it. As we go to 0 from above, we're getting close to 1. As we go to 0 from below, 
we're getting close to negative 1. Well, what happens as we're getting close to 0? Well, now we have a problem. Should it be 1? Should it be negative 1? Should it maybe be halfway in between? And the answer is none of those. It's a does not exist. As a general rule, what we have is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is a value l if and only if both the one-sided limits exist and they equal each other. So this can be a very useful thing to say if you have a complicated limit, look at what happens from each side, because oftentimes if you look from each side, it simplifies things. On a side note, if you were to, to sketch this function, absolute value of x over x, what you would see is it has the following shape. It's positive 1 if we're greater than 0, and it's negative 1 if we're less than 0, and at 0, it's just undefined. It doesn't have a good definition. All right. Well, let's try something a little bit more interesting. Again, this is a, a piecewise function. So given that f of x is 1, if I'm less than or equal to 0, x squared if I'm between 0 and 1, 2 if I'm equal to 1, and 2 minus x if I'm greater than 1, find these limits. And so I, I have a lot of information here. And so let's go through and, and figure this all, all out. We're going to take the limit as x goes to 0 from below. So I need to be below 0. Well, that's good. I, I know what happens when I'm below 0. So I can replace f of x by its definition. So that's as x goes to 0 from below of 1. Okay, well what is that? Well that's 1. Because the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 is 1. Now, let's do as x goes to 0 from below of f of x. So I need to be above 0. Now here, sort of there's an interesting thing, is all three of these pieces are above 0. 1 is above 0, being above 1 is above 0, being between 0 and 1 is definitely above 0. So the question is, well, which one is the right definition to pick? And now we think about what limits are. Limits say, what's happening nearby? So I only care about what's right next to, to my, my point. So I want to be right next to 0, but above 0. So these last two are not right next to 0. They're, they're away from 0. It's this second piece. So I'm going to be looking at this x squared term. So this is the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared. All right, well, that's a polynomial. So we know how to evaluate polynomials. You plug in x equals 0, goes to 0 squared, which is 0. Now, you can combine these two pieces of information and say that the limit as x goes to 0 of f of x does not exist. So, all right, so now we know that at 0, it doesn't exist. Hmm, all right, well now let's uh, try something else. Let's do the next one. Limit as x approaches 1 from below. So I want to figure out, well, which one should I pick? So it's my, which piece is the right piece? So it's not just I want to be below 1, but I want to be below, but right next to 1. So this first part, that's too far away. That's not close to 1. So we go to the second part. See, the second part, that's right next to 1. I'm just barely touching. Just, well, not touching, but I'm just below 1. So we're going to use our definition. So that's the limit as x goes to 0 of, oh, sorry, whoops. Ah, I forgot to mark some things down. There should have been a plus here, and that's not zero. We're now at one. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, fixed. All right, x goes to one from below of and of x squared. Well, one squared. One. Great. Limit as x goes to one from above. Now, what do we need? We need to be above one. Well, if we're going to be above one, we need to use the thing that's above 1. So we replace f of x by 2 minus x. Well, that's polynomial. 2 minus 1, 1. Now, what does that allow us to conclude? The limit 
as x approaches 1 of f of x is 1, because they actually match. Now on a side note, what is f of 1? Well, it's 2. Huh, all right. You can actually plot this function. It's not a very hard function to plot. So what does it look like? Well, it looks something like the following. It's 1 if we're below 0. And it includes 1 at 0. And then from 0 to 1, it's the function x squared. So it goes up to there. At 1, it's 2. So I'm, I'm up at 2. And after 1, it's 2 minus x, which looks something like that. So that's our function. You'll notice from the picture we can see, okay, at 0, yeah, it's definitely approaching different values. And at 1, well, the diff it's approaching different, sorry, it's approaching from different sides, but approaches the same value. So the limit exists, even though the limit doesn't match what happens. So that's, that's a type of problem. We're going to get more into these issues about well, what, what do we describe in terms of behavior. That's for another day. Now we want to build up to a really cool fact, and this is going to be a really fundamental fact. But we're going to start by sort of proving something about areas. Okay, so let's start with the following pictures. Okay, so here we have in the same circle in all three cases, these are all the unit circles, the same angle in all three corners. And what we want to do is we've shaded off the pieces. So we have a, a triangle here, what well, looks like a, a piece of a circle, a wedge, Think of it like a, a slice of a pizza or a slice of a pie. And here's a, another triangle. And we want to go through and figure out what are the areas. So let's start on the left. So you have this triangle here. This is, a, we'll call it the area of A. And we think about, well, how do you find the area of a triangle? And the answer is you take one half the base times the height. So the base is the length across the bottom. Notice I'm going from 0 to 1, so the base is 1. The height would be from the vertex at the top straight down, if we went perpendicularly. So it would be the y value at the tip. Now, when you think about the unit circle in terms of theta, the x, y values are cosine and sine. So the y value is the sine of theta. So we get that the area is 1 half times 1 times sine theta, 1 half sine theta. All right, well that's not so bad. Now let's go to our pi, our, our wedge. So how do we find the area there? Well, well we're going to think of this as sort of like a piece of a circle. We say, all right, suppose we were to make the whole circle. So we have a circle here, and it's the formula for the area of the circle is pi r squared. So the area of the whole circle is pi. That's where that pi comes from. We say, well, the proportion of that area, which is the area of b divided by pi, that's the amount of area in that slice, uh, as a percentage, if you will, is the same as the angle theta divided by 2 pi. In other words, it's the same proportion of the central angle to a full revolution. So that 2 pi indicates going all the way around. So we get that the area of b over pi is theta over 2 pi. Multiply both sides by pi. And we get that the area is 1 half times theta. It's actually a really nice formula, and, and one that you may not always think of right away, but it works out really well. In fact, one way to sort of verify is you just think about, well, what, what if theta were 0? Well, you should have no area. Okay, well, that checks out. What if theta were 2 pi? Well, you'd have 1 half times 2 pi, which is pi. And that's the area of a full circle of radius 1. So that's sort of a, a couple of reasonable checks. It's always good to sort of say, does this make sense? And it, and, and it does work out. Last case, C. Another triangle. Now, this one's a little bit more subtle. We say, OK, what do we have? Well, again, it's, there, it's a triangle, so it's the base is 1. The claim here is that this vertex 
is located at the point 1 comma tangent theta. Now the way to see that is just think about it as a ratio. So if I have theta, this is a right triangle, I'm going straight up. I know my adjacent side, and I want to know that the, the y coordinate is my opposite side. The, the trigonometric function which relates to those is tangent. So tangent of theta is the opposite over my adjacent. So tangent of theta has to be the length of my opposite side. So that's where that coordinate comes from. So the area is 1 half times 1 times tangent theta. 1 half tangent theta. Now, nothing too surprising here. But here is sort of the icing on the cake. If you look at these areas, you'll notice that A is inside of B. Because the difference is this sort of little tiny sliver here. Similarly, B is inside of C. The difference being this sort of piece out here. So that the area of A is smaller than the area of B. That's smaller than the area of C. So that says that 1 half sine theta is below 1 half theta. And that's below 1 half tangent theta. Now here we use the fact that tangent is sine over cosine. So that's 1 half sine over cosine. Now everything has a half in it, okay? So we cancel off the halves. So what does that give us? Well, let's just do some little math here. Cancel off the halves. Let's look at this first expression. Sine of theta is less than theta. So sine of theta less than theta, there's a little bit of room up here. Divide both sides by theta, because we're going to assume here that theta is, is positive. And that lets us conclude that sine of theta over theta is less than 1. So we get that sine of theta over theta is less than 1. So now we have a nice fact. So that's the first part. But wait a second, we could have used the second part. Remember the second part here is the following. So that says that theta here is less than sine theta over cosine theta. Now what will we do here? We're going to move the cosine theta over, move the theta down. So this will give us that cosine theta is less than sine theta over theta. And that's that other inequality. So we've now have the following. Sine theta over theta, we can conclude, is between two different things. It's between 1 and it's between cosine theta. Well, all right, that's uh, believable, but is it useful? Let's, uh, one more detour, one more detour. So one of the things is that what we just did is that we didn't do it for all theta. We did it for all theta that was sort of a little bit above zero. What about for theta a little bit below zero? And the answer is we were going to use symmetry. So just a reminder. We say that a function is an odd function is if we plugged in the negative value, the result is the negative of what we would have plugged in if we plugged in the positive value. So things that are odd include the sine function, the tangent function, x, x cubed, uh, or even more exotic functions like e to the x minus e to the negative x. Now where does the name odd come from? Essentially it comes from, if you look at polynomials, if you see odd powers, that's an odd function. An even function is one where if you plug in negative x, you'd get the same thing as if you plugged in positive x. So examples of even functions are cosine, secant, x squared, x to the fourth, e to the x plus e to the negative x, and, and, and so forth. This gets its name, if you look at it, in terms of polynomials, these are even powers. So, so the odd functions are like odd polynomials, even powers, even functions are like even degree polynomials. Now, why is this useful? Well, it turns out that sine theta over theta is even, which means that we have this type of symmetry going on. So whatever happens on the right-hand side, we can turn it over. That happens on the left-hand side. So we can conclude that if we're near zero, whether we're positive or negative, 
we're in between cosine theta and 1. All right, good. Well, what's the punchline? Let's graph them. Here's cosine theta. Here's 1. And we have this other function called sine theta over theta. Now, what does it do? Well, we don't know. It could wiggle. It probably doesn't, but it's got to be in between these two. And if we look, it's got to stay in between cosine theta and 1. Now, what happens? Well, as you go to 0, 1 goes to 1. And cosine goes to 1. Everything is going to 1. And therefore, by squeezing, we can conclude that the limit as theta goes to 0 of sine theta over theta is 1. Now this is boxed, which means it's really important. In fact, it's so important, we'll double box it, because it's a double box type of thing. In fact, that still doesn't show its importance. We're going to put stars by it. Yes, because that's how important it is. In fact, that still probably doesn't convince you. These aren't just stars. These are shooting stars, because this, this is an important formula. It's very nice. Now, why is it important? Look at the two parts you have. In the top, you have something that's trigonometric, the sine function. In the bottom, you have just the, the theta. That's algebraic. So what this limit is doing is it's merging together trigonometry and algebra. And so whenever we, we're faced with limits that we want to somehow mix the two together, this is the, the fact that we're going to use. So it's going to be a very important limit as we go forward. All right. Example. Let's do some examples using this beautiful fact, this amazing fact we've just discovered. Find the limit as theta goes to zero of sine 2 theta over theta. Now, let's talk about sort of two different approaches. So approach one. Well, we can say, look, I really want to make it look like sine theta over theta. Okay, no problem. What we'll do is we'll use the fact that we know trig. Because, you know, we learned trig before we took calculus. And it turned out that one of the things we learned is that sine of 2 theta has a nice expression. That can be written as 2 sine theta cosine theta, double angle formula, over theta. And now we'll regroup and say, well, I have this one part, sine theta over theta, and then I have everything else. And when you have that, you can say, look, as long as your parts behave nicely, then you understand the whole. Sine theta over theta, that behaves nicely. That's what we just proved. That's going to 1. 2 cosine theta, that's going to 2. 1 times 2, that's 2. Done. Done. But wait, we said there was another way. What's another way to do it? Well, here's the philosophy. We're going to really dig into this in our some more examples in just a moment here. But what the key is, these parts, the, the inside of the sine function, and whatever is below, they just have to match. And as long as they match and they're going to zero, life is good. So instead of trying to rewrite so that we have a sine theta, let's just get it so it's matching. So this is the limit as theta goes to zero of sine of 2 theta, and now over theta. Okay, but here's the key. We're going to multiply by 2 and 2. Notice that the 2s are in different locations, so they actually cancel each other out. So that's good. So we haven't actually changed the limit. We've rewritten. Now, these parts match. 2 theta, 2 theta. And as theta goes to 0, 2 theta goes to 0. So again, this part's going to 0. This matches. It's going to 0. So th what's going to happen is that this part goes towards 1. So then we have a 2. So that's 2 times 1, or 2. All right. Good. Well, let's try a couple more. So, uh, 
All right. Find the limit as theta goes to zero of one minus cosine theta over theta. Now, what are we going to do? Well, we see we've got trigonometry and we've got algebra. So whenever we see trig and algebra together, we know in the back of our minds, we need to somehow exploit this fact. We need to get down to having a sine theta over theta somehow, some way. Everything will get boiled down to this fact. So you say, all right, we want to turn that cosine into a sine. Now, one minus cosine, we can't do that. So we start digging through our, our basic facts. And then we say, oh, wait a second. There was this cool thing that said one minus cosine squared is sine squared. Well, that's useful. So how do I make this into a one minus cosine squared? Well, I can't just put a square because, you know, that changes the problem. But I can do things that would make it squared if I'm careful. So the thing I can do is we can introduce a conjugate. So we can say, look, we're going to multiply by 1 plus cosine theta over 1 plus cosine theta. And the reason we do that is if you want to get 1 minus cosine squared, 1 minus cosine times 1 plus cosine is indeed 1 minus cosine squared. All right, downstairs theta, 1 plus cosine theta. 1 minus cosine squared. So, that's the limit. Theta goes to zero. Sine squared theta. Then we have a, a theta and a one plus cosine theta. And so, what is that? Well, we say, look, sine theta over theta, pull off one of those. So, we're going to rewrite this a little bit. We're going to pull off a sine theta over theta and say, well, what's left? Well, upstairs we have a sine theta. And downstairs, we have 1 plus cosine theta. And now, look at each piece. Sine theta over theta, that goes to 1. That's our, our fact. Sine theta over 1 plus cosine theta goes towards 0 over 2. Because sine of 0 is 0, and cosine of 0 is 1. So, it goes to 0. Well, that's okay it goes to 0. It's not 0 over 0, it's just 0. So the answer is it goes to 1 times 0, which means... And this is equal to zero. All right, cool. Well, let's try one a little bit similar, but probably slightly different. And we can see it's like almost the same. The, the only difference between this one we just did and the, and the next one is that the denominator is now squared. So we run the same process. So this is the limit. Theta goes to zero. Multiply by the conjugate. So, it takes us just a second here. And so we're going to multiply by the conjugate, and we're going to substitute right away. So this is the limit. As theta goes to zero of sine squared theta divided by, whoops, ah, forgot the square there. Divided by theta squared times one plus cosine theta. Now, you'll notice we have a, a sine squared and we have a theta squared. So we're going to pull off a sine theta over theta and then we're going to pull off a second sine theta over theta. So this becomes the limit as theta goes to zero of sine of theta over theta times another sine of theta over theta times one over one plus cosine of theta. This first part goes to one, the second part goes to one, and the last part goes to 1 over 2. So that the limit, 1 times 1 times 1 over 2, is 1 half. And there you go. Now here's a fun fact. What does this say? Well, it says if theta is pretty close to 0, we get that 1 minus cosine theta over theta squared is pretty close to a half. You can write this in the following way. It says that 1 minus cosine theta over theta squared is about one half. So if you multiply both sides by theta squared and rearrange, this also tells us that near zero, cosine theta is about one minus one half theta squared. 
So if you were to graph the cosine function, in fact, we just had the cosine function a moment ago, this cosine function near zero looks a lot like the parabola 1 minus 1 half theta squared. And we got that using some very basic limits. Now, if you have any friends taking Calculus 2 right now, they're going to take the whole semester, and, and within about the last week of Calculus 2, they're going to get that fact. And you're just going to be like, oh, yeah, we learned that first week of Calc 1. Easy, easy. So, yeah, of course it's easy. <coughs> All right. Find the limit as t goes to 0 of sine of 3t over sine of 4t. Now here, it's not so obvious, how do we use our fact? Because right now, there's nothing indicating that we have anything algebraic. It looks like it's just pure geometry. Let's do something so we can use our fact. So, this will be the, we can do the following. We can say, look, let's introduce things that are helpful. So limit as t goes to zero, and so I'm going to think of this as a fraction, sine of 3t over something, and then I'm going to have over sine of 4t over something. Now what would I like? Well, I'd really like to have there be a 3t here. So I'm going to put a 3t here for now. And I'd really like there to be a 4t. So I'm going to put a 4t for now. And you're probably thinking, are you allowed to do that? And the answer is, not yet, but we'll get to the place where we are allowed. Right now we've changed things. And so to figure out whether or not we're allowed to do it, we have to figure out, well, how much did we change? We've put t's here, so that's changed things, but you'll notice that the t's will actually cancel out. So the net effect of the t's is 1, life is good. But the 3 and the 4 aren't going to cancel out they're, because they're different. But we can fix that. We can put a 4 here, and we can put a 3 here. So this 4 cancels with that 4, and that 3 cancels with that 3. And now we're, we're in pretty good shape. So you'll notice here we have this 3 fourths, and that's a constant. One of the things we know about limits is you can pull out a constant. So I'll just pull that constant out. So we have 3 fourths. Then you're going to have the limit as t goes to 0 of sine of 3t over 3t in the top divided by sine of 4t over 4t in the bottom. And now the question is, well, what happens to these? Well, the, the moral here is that sine of 3t over 3t, that part goes towards 1. And sine of 4t over 4t goes towards 1. And therefore, the limit goes towards 1 over 1, which gives us 3 fourths. Now, it sounds like that was a very simple thing to do, but let's be a little bit careful here. So when we talk about this limit, limit as t goes to 0 of sine of 3t over 3t, what we can do is we can, we can do a changing of names. See, t is, is something which is not fixed. It's, it's a process. So we're going to change our name. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace 3t by theta. So we'd have sine of theta over theta, then it was a limit. Now previously our limit was in terms of t, but now it's going to be theta. Now so as t goes to zero, theta is 3t, what happens to theta? The answer is theta goes to zero. And so we get that this is really a sine theta over theta. And, and this can happen quite frequently, so we could have said many things. Uh, so if you say the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x over x, well, again, I could replace the name. In this case, x becomes theta. This is also going to be 1. If I said the limit as, you know, our smiley face goes to 0 of sine of our smiley face over our smiley face, well, that's also 1. Again, I'm just changing names. And this ability in calculus to sort of substitute one name for another name. In other words, it's, it's essentially renaming variables. It's a really important idea. and something that will come up uh, several times throughout 
our calculus course. So it's, it's really convenient. The rule of thumb tree member is that what do we need? We need to have that whatever's inside the sign has to match what's below it. So the 3t has to match the 3t. And whatever that expression is, it has to go to zero. And as long as those two things hold, these match and go to zero, then we can say, aha, it's essentially using this fact with a new name. So this goes towards one. So that's why the, this goes to one. Similarly, this goes to one. And that's why we get our beautiful answer. Because, of course, math is beautiful.